mic's not on. Test. There it is. Got me? Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. How many people feel or know in their hearts that every single day is a good day to study God's word? Give God some praise if you feel that way. I don't know about you, but I'm extremely excited, joyed, elated even, that we are able to experience this 10th lecture on the book of Acts, presented by our very own Reverend Dr. James A. Jameson, who is very astute in sharing the word with God's people. So I'm extremely excited. So in that spirit, in that spirit, I want to go to God's throne of grace to prepare our hearts for this 10th lecture, this 10th lection. So let us pray. Father God, eternal, we come to you this evening, Father, once again, with joy and excitement in our hearts, Father God, that we get to experience your word as God's people. Father God, we thank you for your gift. Father God, we thank you for your word and what it's able to do, Father God, when we open its pages, the pages of the Bible, Father God, and read life into our lives, Father And when the word is taught in a manner that builds us up, Father God, we are just so thankful and blessed here at the Brooklyn Baptist Church. Father God, we ask that you would be with us wherever we are, here in person, on Facebook, on YouTube, on the app, on the website, Father God. We ask that you would just move your spirit, that this lesson, this lecture, from your word, from the book of Acts, taught by the man of God, Father God, would be a blessing to those in attendance. Father God, we ask that you would lift the man of God right now as he opens your word to us. Father, be with him. Father God, hold his hand as he shows us what you have given him. Father God, we ask all these things right now in your son's Jesus name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our um, 10th lecture and study on the Book of Acts. We certainly welcome everyone. We thank uh, Reverend Alex Jackson for leading us in that devotion and opening things up for us so that we might um, begin our lecture, our study tonight, our 10th lecture in this study of the Book of Acts, the birth of the church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, all of you who are joining us by YouTube, by Facebook, by whatever virtual means that you are joining us tonight. Thank you for allowing us into your homes as we share and study together with each and every one of you. Last uh, chapter, we looked at how the church should be a loving church, a praying church, a gathering church a fellowshipping church where we saw the Holy Spirit move as the old people used to say from heart to heart, from mind to mind, and breast to breast, in so much so that they shared everything in common. Well, tonight as we get to chapter three, (coughs) we enter into an area what has been called the first recorded miracle in the New Testament church. This chapter has also been a subject of many sermons, memorable messages. I can think of myself, by our very own pastor, Dr. Charles B. Jackson, powerful revival sermons then on Sunday morning from this passage and this text. 
And so tonight, as we begin our study with this memorable passage, we are going to ask Jackson, if he would, for us through 13. Hopefully we'll get to those tonight. If not, that's fine. But so that we might set the pericope for us tonight, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 13 from the NIV reads as follows. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. Where was he put? Where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. When they saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter took straight. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, taking him by the right hand. He helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Then he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gates called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement. At that, what had happened, filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Conlade. When Peter saw this, he said to him, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he, though he had decided to let him go. All righty. Thank you. Uh, here ends the reading, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. As I said, this is the church's first recorded miracle, not Jesus' first recorded miracle, but the church's first recorded miracle. God was now ready to reach another great harvest of souls. It was now time to attract the attention of the people, so he reached down and healed a single man. A man whom everyone knew and filled the man so full of the Holy Spirit. Again, we talk about now how we are really going to see how perhaps in our studies over the years we have not really zoned in on just how active and important the Holy Spirit was to the development, the strength, and the success of the New Testament church. So, the full of the Holy Spirit, we see the Holy Spirit at work. And the man just went wild with excitement and joy. Such a miracle and behavior naturally attracted the attention of the public. Now, says, now Peter and John were going up together into the temple complex at the hour of prayer, which was three in the afternoon. The Jewish day began at 6 a.m. and ended at 6 p.m. You would know prayer was essential, was an important ritual and way of life for the devout Jew. 
There now, if you would take note, were three special hours of prayer, 9 a.m., 12 midday, and 3 p.m. Agreed that prayer was efficacious wherever it was offered, but they thought that it was doubly special. And in this prayer was offered in the temple courts. One, because you had a good audience. So everybody was there. A lot of people were there. And so they thought that it was something special when these prayers were offered in the temple courts. But notice something interesting here about the apostles. They kept up the customs in which they had been trained. They had been trained to pray. Now, when we talk about this hour of prayer, Peter and John <clears throat> were faithful prayer warriors. The praise, the ninth hour, was around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Jews observed these three stated times. The very fact that Peter and John were going into the temple to pray in the case, what about them? They were men of prayer, right? They were men of prayer. Can you imagine what changes we could make if we had three specific times for prayer every day? Not just praying on the run, not praying every now and then, not just praying while we're on the go, but going about our daily affairs, which is what we so often claim to use the savage our consciousness. But actually, just think about having three set periods where you had consecrated time in prayer and devotion with God. Now, when I thought about this and how this tradition had been perpetuated and continued to go. Remember, perhaps Daniel was in that tradition, remember, where he would pray three times a day. But it also made me think about a song of our forefathers. And I just wondered, Pastor, now, were they familiar with that when they pinned the words of the song, just whisper a prayer, Right? Note about this. There are three times, right, in that song. Just whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. And whisper a prayer in the evening. That's three times. Right? The completion perfect at three times. And, I, and I, that song is amazing how the Spirit brought that. Was while our folk were on it. Our forefathers knew what they were talking about. As we said, the worth and the power of prayer. Whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. And whisper a prayer in the evening and it would do what? Keep your heart in tune. I said, my, 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 our forefathers were on this thing. Just whisper a prayer. So, it was through this life and teaching of prayer, as it was with Jesus. You know, Jesus was a man of prayer. He did nothing, right, without praying. So, they, like Jesus, were able to work through these trying and difficult times and help to power and empower the desperate needs of suffering men. All right. Let's look at verses 3, 2 through 3. And it says, A man who was lame from birth was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful. So he could beg from those entering the temple complex. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter the complex, 
he asked them for help. Now, if you want to know something about the custom, in the East, it was a custom for beggars to sit at the entrance to a temple or shrine or such a place because it was considered the best of all stances because when the people came in to worship God on their way to worship, it was thought that they would be more likely to be generous to their fellow men. And I wondered about that if they were out in front of our churches on Sunday morning, would you become annoyed with them or would you be more likely to be more generous? Or would you hurriedly walk pay and God bless you. <laughs> and I thought about it because they are, you know, they're placing me at the church in front of the synagogues. So would we ignore them like so many do in our day and time, or would our hearts be moved to compassion? Don't answer that too fast, because I see how y'all drive past people in the intersection. That's a whole other thing. I'm, I'm coming to that one in a minute. Now, but I, as I come to that, y'all notice the people that we see today seem to have taken a page out of this. Y'all notice how strategically people are placed right in the islands when you are either coming off the ramp, right? Or if you're getting ready to go off or right there in the middle, if you're coming to the light, it's kind of strategic, isn't it? Well, the people, and I thought about that. I said, wow, we really haven't stopped that. People still do that. Why? Because if you're in the places where there's very busy traffic, right? So they strategically place themselves in these places because it's a numbers game. Out of a thousand people passing by somebody, right, is going to give them something. So we have people today, homeless, different people, who strategically put themselves in front of Walmart, other stores. I've been hit up at gas pumps. I mean, you know, different places where people strategically sit. And I think they wait for church folk, too, when we come out with our suits on Sunday and everything into the stores. Uh, Hello, you look like a man or woman of God. And when they start with that, you know it's coming. You know you know what's going on. Now, this gate called beautiful, it was called beautiful because it was one of the favored entrances. The gate is called because of its magnificent folding doors, which were about 50 feet high and 40 feet wide, and they were covered over with gold. So it was an awesome something to see when you came in. And because it was layered with gold and precious stones, that's why it's called the beautiful gate. Because when one came in and saw it, one was in awe of the architecture and the structure of the temple of the building. And it was truly a beautiful gate. So that's why it's called the beautiful gate. And it was the favorite entrance by which people like to go into the temple. This, as I said, it reminds us where many of the homeless people position themselves today in intersections at traffic lights, on on ramps, and as Peter and John entered the temple, the lame man called out to them, and ask for some money. So many of you have seen that, right? The people, they're strategically sitting in certain places, and they are asking for something, for some money, for some help. All right. Three, four through six. Peter, along with John, 
look at him intently. Notice they didn't do like some of us, like, Lord have mercy. Oh, God, here we go. Right? Here we go again today. You know, ain't nothing wrong with that, man. I think. But the text says, and so when you look at this in terms of the Greek, it's almost like they had binoculars. They didn't just look at him, but they looked at him intently. Y'all know how it is to look at somebody intently, isn't it? To almost burn a hole in them when we, um, when we look at them. So they looked at them in him intently. They were fixed on him. So, and they said, look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold. But what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Peter demanded the man's attention and the beggar gave it. Obviously expecting a gift, what was offered, however, was not money, but rather something far more valuable. Y'all do know that sometimes there are some things that you, money, right, came by healing, came by health, came by miracles, and sometimes it's not money that we need. It's other things that we need, and we know that because this man has perhaps collected a lot of money over a period of time, but his condition is still unchanged. So that's perhaps, using my sanctified Baptist imagination, perhaps is what Peter them said. And they know we don't have any money, but we got something else that is much more valuable that we're going to give you what you really need. It's not money. That you, there's an M word, but it ain't money that you need. Something far more valuable. So it says, Peter commanded the beggar. What boldness. Now you see them, Peter, y'all see them down there yourself. Y'all pass by several times. Don't you think if the man could have, would have gotten up? No. So it says they commanded him to get up and to walk. The command was not by Peter's authority, but rather in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, calling on Christ's power and authority. The apostles were doing this healing through the Holy Spirit's power given to them by Christ, not their own. Read Luke 10, 17. Luke 10, 17 reads as follows. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He, in his name. Notice what they said. They didn't say they submitted to us just and stopped there. Right? Because then they would have been taking credit. But they submitted to us in your name. Now, notice, if you will, then, notice something interesting about the man. He was not even looking up at Peter and John when he asked them for some money. Some arm for arms of years of having people, this man perhaps, like so many others, have seen the other people look the other way, taught him that he was different and did not fit in. Isn't that how we treat 
the poor, the broken, the oppressed. When we look at them, we look the other way. And so he perhaps felt he didn't fit in. And from the first, even perhaps as a small child, he had probably grown into a shy, withdrawn, embarrassed person. A person unable to look people. You ever seen some people, you know, they can't even hardly, you know, they've, they just don't even hardly look you in the face, right? And this man was a living picture, unfortunately, of so many in the world. This man was a living picture, suffering perhaps so much from the neglect of an unconcerned and selfish and hoarding world. Y'all seen the show Hoarders, right? Boy, <laughs> some of the old folk need an intervention. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, some of them had so much stuff that some of it had rotted. They didn't even know because it was so packed in layers of stuff that they were never going to use. And so the challenge to us is to never be come to that point to where we don't feel the urging or the nudging of the Holy Spirit for us to share with, I, you know, I'm guilty, I'm going to collect the rest of y'all, I've, or I'm going to lose weight. And if you're like me, you've been saying that by five or six years now. And some of us longer than that. You got shoes, you, you know you can't get your foot in those things no more. And some of the dresses still got tags. Some of y'all got stuff like Nick Cannon, you got shoes all over. <laughs> now, come on, you ain't going to never be able to wear no 300 pairs of shoes. If you want, I mean, that's, what's that, uh, that's just a little bit less than 65. If you want each one every day for a year, almost for a year, right? So, but the Holy Spirit encourages us, as we saw in chapter 2, that they gave so that no one had lack, right? And so we have to be careful ourselves because we, too, could be harboring a hoarding spirit. Let's give that to somebody who needs it, a mother's children who needs clothes. Let's give them to somebody who can really use them. Let's bless somebody that can really be blessed, okay? All righty, this is what I love here, though. This verse 7 through 8. Then, taking him by the right hand, he raised him up. Notice now, they touched him. And, and I'm, I'm well aware that in the society, our culture, and everything now where, you know, touching can be a troublesome thing. It can really be a tricky thing about touching. But I submit this evening that you really can't help somebody if you don't touch them. Because notice when they says, and they raised him up, when they touched him at once. Notice the connection. And they touched him. And at once, his feet and ankles became, so all makes you sound like those dry bones coming together, right? And so he jumped up, stood, and started to walk. And he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All right. To encourage the lame man to begin, Peter reached out for him to help him up. The terms that follows here reflect Luke's medical orientation. 
So when you see this language, don't forget that Luke is considered to be a physician, right? So Luke's medical orientation here is descriptive of the man's feet and ankle bones. You know, that sounds almost like an orthopedic doctor or somebody. Which, to this point, had never been able to support the man. Well, he healed and strengthened. Not only could he stand, but he also immediately tried out his new legs. I looked at my legs. I looked at my feet. And they looked new too, right? Because they were new to him because he had never been able to use them. So now he's trying out these new legs and he runs full throttle. Moving quickly from standing to beginning to walking and ultimately to leaping. Amid his excitement and this emotional moment, he praised God who had given him a new lease on life. I want to say something for a moment before I expound on the rest of this, because I forgot to tell you about the importance of in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, to call upon the name of someone, when you call on their name, means to call upon their authority and their power, their office, their nature, their stature, and the character of the person. The person named then stands for all <clears throat> that the person is. A king may send a decree throughout his kingdom, but the decree goes out under his name and his authority. Government or business officials may send a memo throughout his department but it doesn't go out in somebody else's name. It goes out under his or her name. So under his or her authority. So it is in the name or the power of Jesus that the needs have to be met. It's not Peter. It's not silver and gold. Silver and gold can never bring health, not permanently. Ill health or disease or accidents eventually catches us all, and when it does, no amount of money will be able to help us. It then is Christ alone, his presence and power, that can meet our need. Peter knew that the power of Jesus Christ dwelt within Christ himself, and only in Christ because he also knew that he possessed the presence and the power of Christ within his body. And that he was called a representative of Christ on earth. Note what Peter said, such as I have, I give thee. So what he's saying is, he had the presence. I don't have money, but I have the presence and power of Christ. It is that which he could give. In fact, that was his very purpose for being on earth, to represent Christ and to share Christ's power with those who were sick and hurting throughout the world. Peter acted first, not the man Peter, but the Lord's representative, his ambassador, Jesus had no way to reach the man. He had already ascended to heaven. But Peter was his representative on earth and his voice of whom he left behind to be his ambassador and his representative. Let me say a little bit more. You can leave that up there. Verses 9 to 3, and I'll come to that shortly. But I want to go back to what I told you about touching. 
the significance of touch and healing. There have been studies that have been done with babies especially, some that were done several years ago, that talks to us about the need and the importance of human touch and human closeness. It is said that when we touch, just hugging, whether it be emotionally, spiritually, or physically, there's something about touching. Hugging and other forms of non sexual touching cause the brain to release oxytocin, known as the bonding hormone. This stimulates the release of other feel-good hormones, such as dopamine and serotonin, while reducing stress hormones, such as cortisol and neoepinephrine. These neurochemical changes make you feel happier and less stressed. Touching. Research suggests that being touched can also lower your heart rate and your blood pressure, lessen depression and anxiety, and boost your immune system, and even relieve pain. Simply put, being touched boosts your mental and physical wellness. Sad to say, though, there was a study done in 1944, and later on it was repeated, where newborn babies were split into two groups, where they did nothing for one group, or you are familiar with that, and just fed them, just gave them the bare necessities. But the others, they placed them in proximity, gave them hugs, gave them attention, gave them affirmation. What do you think happened? The ones who did not receive affirmation and touch, many of them died for lack of affection and touch, while the other group of children thrived. The babies in this group had special facility where their basic needs being changed and birth were met. But the caregivers were instructed not to touch or look at the babies more than needed. No communicating with the babies, no extended interactions, just fill their basic needs and keep the place sanitary. But unfortunately, the experiment had to be halted after just four months by that point because half of those babies died. And we can see it with individuals. We can see it in the lives of people who have not had social interaction and they suffer deficits in their personality. So I wanted to show you the importance of social interaction when we talk about the fact that Peter them just said, Woosa. Right? But they touched him. So there is something to be said for touching. All right. So the next time y'all don't just show people human connection and communication. And my nephew heard me talking about this one time. He lives in Atlanta now. He said, Unc, let me tell you something about that. Yeah, just ignite. He said he was walking down the street one day and his brother kind of had this look on his face. And he said, hey, man, how you doing? And the brother stopped and said, man, you don't know what you did for me. You acknowledged me. You acknowledged my humanity. Thank you for making me feel like I'm somebody and that I matter. There are a lot of broken up, damaged people out there, y'all, who needs some social interaction, some human love, and human connection. And that's what they did for this man. All right. So, this must have been some scene. All right. 
All the people saw him walking and praying. Can you imagine folk who saw somebody sitting down all their lives, and now he's walking, praising God, and the people are like, wait a minute. Ain't that, um, right? You know, dude, that was, you know, he was the one that used to sit out there on I-20 with a sign up, somebody wrote for him, and he was sitting there begging, and well, what happened? And so they were filled, that's what the text says, they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened because they saw for his hand. But this man's condition was. So something right had to happen. Something wonderful had to happen. Can y'all imagine what kind of scene this must have been? This beggar known for years for his crippled condition danced in the temple area with the word of praise to God. And there could be no doubt about who he was. We know, dude. Right? So there could be no doubt about who he was or what had happened. Nor could the people quite appropriately address because they were absolutely astounded. Because this man was now walking and jumping and praising God because the people who knew him when and well had gone in and out of that gate many times, almost stepped on him, and had seen him often, were now filled with amazement. Because undoubtedly, he was different from when they had seen him before. The man was completely changed. His whole being and attitude and life, he was no more shy and reserved, embarrassed and ashamed about not fitting in and being accepted. He was saved and healed inside and out. His whole personality was changed. And he wanted all to know it. I can imagine he was singing, he touched me. What happened to you? Well, I was shackled by a heavy burden beneath a load of guilt and shame. But the master touched me and I am no longer the same because he was touched. All right. Three, nine, two, three. All the people saw him and wondered what happened to him. Let's go on to verse 11. Uh, let us move on to verse 11. All right. Well, we all right. Okay. All right. While he was holding on, but I tell you what, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, oh, no, I need some more. Don't know. No. <laughs> I thought about this and it made me think about Jacob. You know, at the River Jabbok, when he was wrestling with the angel, and Jacob said, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, I can't let you go till you bless me," and. Then, <laughs> And I just thought the text said he was still holding on to Peter and John because something wonderful had happened to this man. And all the people, greatly amazed, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colony. The scene broadened. Solomon's colonnade, if you look at a chart of it, it's, you got the temple here, you go in the back, and you have these columns that are sitting up in the back as you come in. And so they were at his colonnade, and the scene broadened as the beggar 
almost like a young child, was pictured. Can you see it in your mind? Clinging to Peter and John. And then even more people came running to Solomon Colonnade and covered portions of the entrance with the column that stood just east of the outer court. For the Jewish observers and readers, the sign here was too spectacular to overlook. And Isaiah had written of such a time, he says, where the lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will shout and sing. Now, we're moving on as we get to verse 12. The sheen is now going to shift, right? We go from a scene of the church at first healing to where Peter now begins to preach in the temple. We always say that a good sermon introduction is supposed to capture attention, raise a need, and orient listeners to the subject at hand. That's Peter and John's healing of the lame man in the temple courts did all those powerfully. It drew a huge crowd of all awed spectators. It prompted these onlookers to want to know how such a miracle, you know what we always want to know how? Why and how, right? Why and how such a miracle was possible? It gave the apostles then an open door, an opportunity to declare plainly that Jesus crucified and resurrected, was truly the long-awaited promised Messiah who fulfilled all the predictions of the prophets. Remember, we just looked at Isaiah 35, which is kind of a messianic piece where he's talking about some of the things that's going to be the signs of this person, this Messiah, because these signs are going to follow him. The lame are going to walk, the dumb are going to talk, and people are going to jump the lame like deers. So, what Peter did with this, when Peter saw this, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you stare? Why are y'all looking at us like that? As though we have made him walk our, by our own power or godliness. The God, this is the way he gets them, takes them back to their teachings and their upbringing. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you. Now, I want you to notice something as we go through these verses, as we come through this study. He is just going to punch him right between the eyes. Hit him right between the eyes. You hand it over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had already made up his mind to release him, but y'all made sure that he would be crucified. Peter took advantage of a gathered attentive crowd, and he addressed them by making it clear, first of all again, that the miracle was not by their hands, not their personal power or godliness. Rather, this miracle had been performed by God himself for a very explicit purpose. Peter wanted to make it clear to this Jewish crowd that this miracle was the handiwork of the very God 
they claim to follow. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, they are patriarchs, they are fathers. And the God of all our ancestors, the miracle also had a purpose to bring glory to his servant Jesus. Read Isaiah 42 and 1, 49, 6 through 7. Isaiah 42 and 1, and 1 reads as follows. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Isaiah 49, 6 through 7 reads as follows. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation. To the servant of rulers, the king will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who was chosen you. Amen. Peter wanted Jesus identified because he knew how much they believed in the patriarchs. So by placing him in the lineage as one of whom the patriarchs and the prophets prophesied about, it would identify him as the servant Messiah of the Old Testament. Then, as his audience was thinking about this connection, he pressed home the brutal truth. Peter told them point blank that they were responsible for Jesus' death. Now, can you imagine how somebody sets you up? You out there, he preaches his powerful sermon, you're happy in Jesus. And then all of a sudden, uh, but I just want to let you know something, you killed him. What? Yeah, you. You were the ones who were the cause of his death. The Roman leader Pilate had decided to release him. But the Jews had rejected Pilate's offer and made so much fuss, clamored, to have Barabbas, a murderer, released instead. How do you have somebody that you have nothing. You haven't proved any charges against him, but you would rather have a murderer released than an innocent man. Read Luke 23, 13 through 25, and we will close with that for tonight. Luke 23, 13 through 25 reads as such. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him... No grounds for the death penalty. 
Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But with loud shouts, insistently, they demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. Lord have mercy. Hmm. When Peter said, Jesus, whom you handed over, and he meant this literally, Jesus' trial and death had occurred right there in Jerusalem. Only weeks earlier, all Jews were there and thus guilty to the representative leadership. And I just want to say in closing, whenever we disobey God, whenever we break his heart, whenever we don't show love and compassion for our fellow man, brother or sister, we too crucify him afresh. So as we close tonight, if you have enjoyed, I don't want to say if you were inspired or encouraged by what we sought to share tonight in this study of Acts, would you give a donation to help support our evangelism ministry? There are five ways that you can give. One is online, Brooklyn Baptist ORG. Or text to give, 803-223-7519. Or you can mail in to our P.O. Box, 2093 Columbia, South Carolina, 29202. Or drop it off at the Brooklyn Credit Union. Or you can give the Shelby Next app. So that we may increase the evangelistic effort of our evangelism ministry to do such things as they did last week and having the tent revival. We want to continue to support what other initiatives that they might be planning so that we might bring others to Christ. God bless you. Thank you for joining in with us tonight. May we stand. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we come in this Lenten season, may each and every one of us examine ourselves as we look to Easter of your death, burial, and resurrection. May each day when people look upon us, may they know that we have been with you. May the light of your love and peace shine from us when people look at us, they sense caring, loving individuals who love the Lord. Thank you for those who braved the weather and thought it not robbery to join in with us tonight. And those, O oh God, who are joining us through our virtual venues, continue to bless them for the sacrifice of their time. And as we leave this place, dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Grant us all traveling grace and mercy as we return home through the inclement weather. Keep us safe, cover us in your blood. Let all be well upon our return. This we ask in the name of your son Jesus, the Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And thank God.